Hello and welcome back to the Astronomicon, the Eternal Crusade show. As always, I'm your host Cosmic and today I wanted to talk a little bit about combat in the Eternal Crusade and I will talk a little bit about some concerns I have a little bit later in the show. Um, first, I wanted to talk about combat though and I wanted to draw attention to a post by Brent Ellison who is the lead game designer on the Eternal Crusade and a post he made on the forums fairly recently. Now the post is under the thread what is combat like in the Eternal Crusade and if you've been on the Eternal Crusade forums you'll know that that is a particularly long thread and he went to basically address some of the discussions and concerns that people have been having and to clarify some uh, bits of information. So first off he went to talk about preventing executions. So he goes on to say that we've just had an execution brainstorming meeting yesterday to come up with many as many Space Marine and Chaos Space Marine executions as possible before the, pers the first pass of motion capture. Anyway, we wanted to every execution to have a period of time before the target is actually killed. So there's a pose or some such. In this window, you can interrupt the execution to save your friend. After that window, the victim is dead. Even if you interrupt it after that window, the executor still needs to complete most of it to, like for example, the rest of the animation to get their full reward of XP. Um, but even if you interrupt after that pit, that window, the victim will still be dead. So, for an example, if an execution is that you chop off someone's head and hold it up and laugh, you can save the person any time before the head is actually cut off, but the executor doesn't get their bonus until they're actually finished laughing. So they have to finish the full animation to get their full reward of XP. Um, but if you interrupt after, the obviously, the head is removed, then the target is going to be dead. Um, so standard restrictions apply. This is the current plan, but they'll still see how it feels, yada, 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 so it may change. Um, I'm glad that they are putting in preventable executions. I think it's good to do that. I think it would be, it, it wouldn't feel right if you had executions where you couldn't do anything once the animation started. It, would, it wouldn't feel quite right in the world, especially if you're, you know, there's 20 versus 20 in a confined space and someone starts an, a, a, an execution animation and then that base that player is then untouchable until the animation's finished it wouldn't make any sense and i don't think it would detract from the immersion it wouldn't feel right so i definitely think it's a good idea to put preventable executions in there um, and i'm pretty happy about how that is sounding overall he goes on to talk about weapon and class roles um, so what he says is that the intention for every class and weapon type is to have a very distinct role within their faction. I've got a big chart of all the main weapon types and what situations we want them to work in. If the weapon overlaps too much, then we need to do some tweaking to make sure that they have unique strengths and weaknesses. The same goes for classes. In this regard, our focus is making the game where coordination and application of the right type is what wins the battle. Think of it of try to think of what roles mean on a massive scale rather than within single squad. Tacticals need to work together with assault marines, but that actually means a squad of tacticals being applied to the right place to back up another squad of assault marines rather than the squads mixing. In the case of devastators, just like in the tabletop, it makes sense for heavy weapons characters to be supported by a few characters that are good at close to medium range. This is on the battlefield, of course. Uh, in PVA content, you're going to generally be going to, into much smaller groups, so it makes sense to mix things up like traditional adventuring party. These are more akin to pen and paper role-playing experiences after all. So what they're saying is that they want very distinct roles in between the different classes. Um, they want weapons to feel very different from each other and be... Um, different in each situation, have strengths and weaknesses and I think that's the right thing to do in terms of balancing for combat. I think that you don't want um, classes and weapons to feel very similar to each other. Um, you, you want specific roles assigned to each class to make it the best way possible for players to play. I mean, you know, if I choose a Assault Marine, I want my Assault Marine to be very good at close quarters combat but you know going into choosing the assault marine class that you are going to suffer in a long range battle 
and I think it's, it's important to get the balancing right, especially because the game is so PvP focused. I think you need to really nail that balancing down and really nail the class and the weapons balancing. Very, It's very, very important to get that right. Um, he goes on to talk about ability bars. Just to clarify that there basically isn't going to be any ability bars whatsoever. The closest thing to an ability bar will be psychic powers. But in the case of psychic powers, it's not going to be much different from switching weapons or fire modes. Um, there, were, there will he did go on to say that there is going to be special abilities, um, but they won't be hotkeyed or anything like that. Um, our, their intention is to make it more like a sandbox game, like Prototype or Infamous, where you can basically perform special powers by doing normal functions. For example, you might be able to replace your standard sprint charge attack with a jump slash or shoot flames out when you land a jump pack. So it's about augmenting um, basic abilities into something more special and unique as you progress. Um, and I think that's a really good way of doing it. Um, he goes on to explain about psychic powers and pistols. Um, he goes on to say that for the launch of psychers, the plan is to always give you a pistol. But if you activate a witchfire power, you shoot that instead and the pistol goes away. Depending on what style of psyker you are, you may or may not end up using the pistol at all. But it's there if you need it. So you will always have that backup there. Um, we really wanted to create the feeling of being a mega-powered psyker that launches lightning bolts left to right, so we're going to experiment with some methods to encourage that behaviour instead of just firing the occasional little blast um, for fear of running out of warp charges. For example, it might be that you activate a power that lasts a certain amount of time, during which you can shoot as many blasts as you want. This is honestly one of the areas of combat where we're in the earliest parts of development though, and I can only speak to our intentions and what kind of feelings we want to create. The specific mechanics of this this part of the game are quite a ways off. So they're still in early development of that, um, trying to figure out what they want to create. Um, and I think it, it's definitely a good way to go in terms of how it's sounding at the moment. I think that you, re for as I said before about the classes, you want each class to feel unique and distinct. I think that if you're going to play a Psyker, you want that Psyker to rely on their Psychic powers and what they're good at, rather than having basically a Tactical Marine who's got the ability to shoot a Warp Blast every now and again. Um, I think you want the Reliance to be on the um, Psychic powers rather than um, traditional weapons. Um, he goes on to talk about weapon unlocks as well. Um, he goes on to say that the point of the class switching system is to make it so that you can specialise, but quickly swap to the right kind of role necessary for the situation. The alternative is that we either have lots of situations where your class is obsolete, or that we make every class better in every situation, which would ultimately require taking away a lot of the specialness from each class. We're, talk we're taking a similar philosophy with weapons. When you choose to invest in a Devastator tree, you'll earn access to the most iconic weapons, such as last scanners, etc., fairly early on, so that depending on the situation, you can switch to something that will make, it, make you an effective team member. In this regard, we're giving you a breadth of the breadth of scope relatively quickly, but the deeper you invest into the specialization you'll get, um, the more specialization you'll become. So the deeper invest, you invest into that particular tree, um, the more specialised you will become. Something like the multi-melter might be deeper in the tree because it's harder to use and even more situation specific, but a very powerful if applied in the right context. And there's also specific weapons to find um, that take that specialisation further. Uh, next is a big one. Next he goes on to talk about terminators. Terminators and the whole subject of Terminators in the game has been a hot topic in the Eternal Crusade community. It's something that people have fears over and um, I think valid fears at that. I think that you, it, it's definitely something that I've been thinking about for some time. Um, but I'll tell you what Brent Ellison has to say on that. He said, I think I've covered this a few times before, but I'll say it again, that our intention is to not put artificial limits on what players can do, but instead make it so that it doesn't make sense to field certain units en masse. It's the same sort of philosophy we had with our hero units. Sure, you could spawn 100 
at once if you coordinated with everyone, but why would you? It'd be a huge waste of resources, which could be going towards vehicles and other things, because both Terminators and Heroes are being designed to be optimal in certain circumstances and still require support. Keep in mind that Terminator armour is clunkier and slower than power armour, so they're sitting ducks for certain types of weapons and are not going to be great at foot slogging. Long story short, if you frequently see dozens of Terminators marching in step, we will have done something wrong in the balance department. Now, I'm a little bit of column A and column B on this one. I think that it's definitely good that they're not putting artificial limits on what players can do, because then you end up with a game and certain mechanics that feel forced upon you, and I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Um, but at the same time, you will. the thing is with games such as PvP games is you are going to get big coordination. I mean, you look at Planetside 2, there are guilds and um, teams of players in Planetside 2 where they have 50 plus players and they coordinate very, very well. Now, I don't think you'll end up seeing 100 Terminators, 100 Terminators going in one direction, you know, a column of Terminators attacking. I don't think you'll end up seeing that. Um, but I think that they should make it so that it is difficult to be a ter just com completely keep spamming Terminators all the time as a faction. I think that would be a bad way to make it if you could, if you ended up just having Terminator after Terminator after Terminator on, on each on on a specific battle. Um, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Um, but as I say, it's still early in development, so we'll see come the beta what actually happens with Terminators and Hero Units specifically. Um, and he finally goes on to talk about 1,000 player battles, and he says it's the same sort of thing here. If we do a bad job, then 1,000 player battles will be a mess, but we're trying to avoid that. In our level design and territory control mechanics, we're trying to make it so that a battle spreads across multiple locations to keep things interesting. 500 players smashing themselves against a wall repeatedly would get pretty tiring. Now, I actually have some really interesting concerns about this. Um, the reason being that I want 1000 player battles to be a mess. I don't think it's um, good to try and section off parts of your faction. I think it is it is important in the level design, obviously, to have places where you do need to split up your forces um, and try and attack different locations and try and and I think that is important. But I think in terms of you know if you're on an open plane, open plane and you get 500 versus 500. That is going to be a mess because you know battles are messy, and I think that's important to have that in there in some form. I understand what he's trying to say there. But I don't think they should make the level design and territory control mechanics too controlling over how players go about going to their objectives. I think that it's important to let, you know, at the end of the day, like in, in EVE Online, if people want to go and try and, you know, like, like recently they've had that massive battle that was really, really expensive um, and people coordinated and they all went into a location and it was a massive mess. That's what battles are. You get a couple of thousand people in a battle, that's what it's going to be a big mess um, because battles are messy. Um, so I don't think they should... I, I'm really cautious on how they do the level design um, and I really hope that they don't make it so that they're almost funneling players into locations to try and make it a bit more arena-based because I don't want an arena combat game. I want an open world combat game. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, so that's all Brent Ellison had to say about that. Um, so do let me know your thoughts in the comment section below about what he had to say there. I will link the post in the description below so you can go and have a read of it yourself. Um, it's it, quite interesting stuff and it's definitely something to um, start thinking about as we get closer to you know, alpha and beta. Um, one thing I do want to talk about is the world design and the feel of the game. I recently played uh, the Titanfall beta. Now, obviously, the very different types of games um, in terms of, you know, Titanfall's a, f a first person shooter and, you know, the Eternal Crusade is going to be an MMO with a third person shooter. Um, 
but what one thing really stuck about about Titanfall is the feel of the game. Titanfall is designed in a way that even small things like getting in and out of uh, vehicles and getting in and out of your mech, um, just even just l normal general movement makes you feel it. It's fluid. It's um, it makes you feel almost epic in a way. In the way that things done, it's so nicely designed that it makes things feel good to, to do simple things. It's good to do simple things, and I really like that about the game. One thing that I'm very cautious of, being that it's a Warhammer 40k game, is the feel of the game. And I don't want this to feel like a Planetside 2 game with a reskin. And I'm very conscious that the game's developers don't make a third-person shooter game with just a Warhammer 40k skin. I want this to feel like Warhammer 40k. I want the, even, the sm that even down to the smallest, tiniest design, I want to feel like I'm in the Warhammer 40k universe. I want things to feel even small actions. I want the game to be designed so that even small things, small animations are really well done and presented in a way that feels right for the universe. And I think that they talk about immersion and um, things like that a lot in previous AMAs. And I think that it is really important for me as a player and as a fan of Warhammer 40k, that the game is immersive and it doesn't feel like I'm playing a game where it could just be a mod. Um, and I think that's important. And um, it'd be interesting to see how, as the game develops, where we actually end up in terms of an immersive experience and the experience being fluid and fun to do, as well as feeling like, you know, you are an epic warrior in the Warhammer 40k universe. So let me know your thoughts um, in the description below. Um, also, if you have any suggestions on topics that I need to have a look at on the forums or anything like that, do let me know. Uh, so thank you so much for watching. Do like, subscribe and leave a comment and I will see you next time.